Okay, kiddos and adults alike. Today I have a special privilege of actually making a uh, educational video for a couple of classrooms uh, back in the beautiful state of Missouri, God's country. Uh, I've actually gotten two requests, one from my sister and another one actually totally random, but it's one of my younger cousin's classrooms, ironically enough. Anyway, so you guys have submitted your questions and I'm just gonna go through absolutely every single one of them here and I'm gonna do my best to make you guys laugh while I do it. Now, some of you did submit the same question, um, which is interestingly enough. So what we're gonna do first, I'm gonna go through and try to answer every question that I can without the hive open, and then we're gonna open up this hive right here. Now, of course, one of the first and favorite questions was, do you ever get stung, or how often do you get stung? And the answer, of course, is absolutely yes, I get stung. Uh, I would say I don't get stung all that often, actually, as much as I mess with bees. Um, but I did get stung just now actually trying to set this camera up. As you can see, there's some, some weeds and whatnot in the foreground, and I had to try to stomp those down, and in doing so, I got, I got stung. Um, one quick lesson when messing with honeybees, of course, is that you always have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. You guys will notice I don't have on my big white suit. That is because you don't always need it. Honeybees are actually very gentle in general. However, there are honeybees that are more aggressive than others. Uh, I intentionally keep very gentle bees and that's because I don't wanna have dangerous bees around and I don't like wearing that suit. So for today, my protective gear is my sunglasses, which are protecting my eyes from the bright sun. Okay, so let's just go down the list here. I've got from Josephine, Delia, and Ricky. They all wanted to know, do bees die when they sting? The worker bees do, yes. Those are all the female bees. They have a barbed stinger, so it's, it's barbed like a fish hook, and when they sting you, it sticks in you. Now, they try to tear loose and get away, and in doing so, they'll rip out their intestines, essentially. Now, the reason they do that is because when they tear loose and get away, they leave behind their venom sac, which is going to make the sting to you actually be much worse. That's why they do that. Honeybees really do not want to sting by default, but they will do it as a matter of defense because they understand that stinging is a sacrificial move. Now there is an exception. The queen bee has a slick stinger, much like a wasp. It does not have a barb on it. The queen bee can sting repetitively and she will not die as a result. However, queens really only sting when they're young virgin queens and they're fighting for dominance. Once they're established as the dominant queen, they'll rarely fight and sting. Instead, they'll run away and hide. Uh, Kaden asks, why does the queen always stay in the hive? Well, that's so she's safe. Um, queen bees, they're very clumsy, they're big, they're awkward, they really can't fight, and they don't want to fight. Their job is to lay eggs and raise new babies for the hive. So, the safest place for them is in the hive. The only time they ever come out of the hive is to mate, or if the swarm, if the hive swarms and moves to a new location. But otherwise, they don't want to be outside the hive any more than you'd want to be outside the safety of your own home. It's dangerous for them. They could get eaten by a bird or a lizard or Lord knows what. So they want to stay inside the hive so that they're protected. Uh, Macy asks, do bees get sick? Yes, they can actually. They can get different um, viruses and different diseases and they can be susceptible to pests and parasites within the hive. I'll be completely honest with you, Macy. I don't know anything about the diseases that they get. I treat my bees 100% natural. I don't give them any medicines. I don't give them anything at all that could make them better if they're sick. I treat them as if they're wild bees in nature. I want them to survive on their own. In doing so, we'll cultivate a stronger, healthier bee that is not dependent upon medicines and antibiotics to survive. Uh, Chloe and Quentin both asks, how do bees know how to make perfect comb? I don't know. I'm an engineer and I'm good at math and I really don't know. Uh, I, I read somewhere one time that they use their forearm as a measuring stick to build a perfect hexagon, but I don't believe that that's true because they actually will build different size hexagons depending on what size bee is going to be raised in the cell. See, your drone bees, which are the males, are actually bigger bee and therefore have to be raised in a bigger cell. So all the little worker bees are going to have the same size forearm, so I can't imagine that they do that unless they do like an arm and a half, which would be kind of weird, right? Um, so no, I, unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Uh, as far as man is concerned, when we build foundations for the bees to build their comb on, 
we actually got that design just by measuring the combs that they built for us and we just copycatted it. Uh, let's see, Peyton asks, how do bees know where the flowers are? Peyton, that is because they have an exceptional sense of smell. Honeybees can smell the sweet nectar of the flower, just like when you smell flowers, you can, different flowers will have different smells. The honeybees can smell that much better than we can. And they use that to hone in on where the flowers are at so that they can find the nectar and the pollen that they want for food. Layla asks, how many babies can a queen have? This is impressive. On average, um, an average queen will lay 1,000 to 1,500 eggs per day. And she does that pretty much year round as long as the weather's good. And a queen can live three to five years. So you guys can do the math as a little homework for you. Figure out how many queen, how many eggs that queen might actually lay in her lifetime and how many potential babies she could have raised. It is a lot. Highly productive queens, specialized breeder queens, can lay 2,000 to 3,000 eggs a day. But on average, we talk, we say 1,000 to 1,500. Damon asks, how big is the hive? Well, Damon, that all depends on the health of the hive, the population of the hive, um, the environmental conditions that they live in. I have some very small hives. I have some very large hives. This one in front of us that we're looking at here, this is a, only a single stack five frame hive. It is a very small hive. But honeybees require a large population for the hive to thrive. A small group of bees, and when I say small, I mean a thousand or less honeybees will not survive. That colony takes thousands and thousands of bees to actually survive and thrive because there's so much work to do. Uh, Damon also asked, what do the drones do? Uh, and in addition to that, Alexis asked, do the drones collect pollen? The drones actually don't do much of anything. The drones are extremely lazy. Their only purpose in the hive is to mate with new virgin queens. The drones don't defend the hive. They don't go forage for food. They don't clean the hive or take care of the babies. All they exist to do is mate. Now, there's a downside to that. Because of that, in the fall time, when the bees are starting to ration out food and they're getting ready to be uh, more conservative for the winter time, they'll actually kick all the drones out for the winter time. They'll kick them out of the hive and tell them good luck. And those poor drones will starve to death or freeze to death. But ultimately, there are no drones in the winter because the hive will kick them all out so that they're not a burden on the food supplies. The drones also, since you guys asked earlier about stings, the drones do not have a stinger. So you can catch a drone and you can shake him around in your hand and make him all sorts of mad and he'll buzz around and put up a big fit, but he cannot hurt you. So it's a lot of fun to catch the drones and play with them. Delaney asks, are all bees yellow and black? Absolutely not. In fact, most of the honeybees, and we'll try to get a better look at them here in a minute, are not yellow or black at all. They tend to have more of a copper color or a tan or kind of a dusky brown. And my favorite is what I call a chocolate queen. I've only seen a few of them. I try to keep them when I find them. They actually have, it looks like milk chocolate, like a candy bar, is the color of their abdomen. It's not copper and it's not black. It's a very pretty brown color. They're very rare and hard to find, but I love them when I find them. Uh, Cassius says, have you ever seen a worker follow a queen? Yes, all the time. The workers are attracted to their queen. Now, contrary to popular belief, the workers don't necessarily protect the queen. They protect the hive as a whole. But the queen is their she's their center she's their mother right so they like to be around her she keeps the whole hive bonded as a single unit but the queen does not make the rules she does not make the orders the workers will follow her around just because they like to be near her not because they're necessarily following her orders or what she tells them to do jacoby says can you eat honeycomb absolutely and it is delicious jacoby um most people are used to just eating liquid honey, but you can take a chunk of honeycomb and you can bite it right off and you can chew on it. And I actually really enjoy doing that. Maybe I'll get a shot of it. If they have any honey in the hive here, I'll, I'll take a bite of honeycomb for you. Um, but when you chew up that wax, it's very soft and you can actually chew it like gum. Uh, so I like to take a bite of honeycomb and then chew that wax for about 10 minutes. Now it'll get gritty, it'll start to fall apart. You can't chew it for a long time like chewing gum, but you can chew on it for a while. If you swallow it, it's absolutely no harm to you at all. There's no real nutritional value to it, but you can swallow the honeycomb. It won't hurt you. Um, but the best honey that you'll ever have in your life, I promise you, is if you take a bite of fresh comb honey. It tastes better. It's more fresh and more pure than the liquid honey that you get out of a bottle. Jacoby also asked, why is there no king bee? Well, that's simply because one isn't needed. 
When a queen mates, she only mates one time at the original, at the beginning of her life, and after that, she never mates again. The hive operates as a whole unit. Um, and again, I mentioned this a little bit ago, the queen does not make the rules, she does not make orders. The whole hive operates as one unit. They just understand what needs to be done. No one's in there barking orders and telling everybody what to do. Um, so there really is no use for a king bee. If he could lay eggs like a queen bee, then maybe. But the queen bee is critical because of course she's the only one that can lay fertilized eggs. The female workers actually can lay eggs, but they've never made it, so their eggs will be infertile and they would not develop into um, actual good worker bees. Unfertilized eggs, not to get too confusing, but this is a challenge to the science teachers, unfertilized eggs actually will develop into drones, which we mentioned earlier, the drones are pretty much useless. So workers who have never mated can lay eggs and they will hatch into drones but those drones are a burden on the hive and they're not really any good to the hive. What the hive needs is the female worker bees. In order for that hive to thrive and survive and grow, it has to have a high, high population of worker bees. Um, so we don't need a king bee because he'd probably be just as useless as the rest of the drones, right? Uh, Jaden, Macy, and Delaney all act, are bees predator or prey? Well, I would say unfortunately that they are prey. They do not hunt other insects. They hunt for nectar and pollen and water. That is their food source. So they are absolutely prey to lizards, birds, uh, frogs, anything that can get a hold of them. Now that doesn't happen to them very often because they are you know, flying everywhere that they go. Uh, but what I do have down here, I'm looking around, I don't see any right now, but we have these little green lizards called anoles. And a lot of times I'll find those little lizards hanging out right around the beehives and they'll hang right on the side of the box and if a bee flies into the box and she's too low, that lizard will snatch her up. Now that doesn't bother me because again, in these boxes, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of bees. And the way I see it is that bee was probably a little slow. She's probably getting a little old anyway, so I don't really mind if the lizard eats her. There's no way that I could ever barricade off my hives to keep all the lizards away, so I just let nature do what it does. Jacob and Drake asked, why do bees follow the queen? I think we mentioned that earlier. Uh, and Elsie says why sometimes they don't. Well, again, we covered that. They follow her because they like to be around her, but they don't need to follow her. A lot of times they'll go and they'll rub up against her, they'll get her smell on their bodies, and then they'll go off to do their job. So it's much like if you were in a room next to a lady that has a very strong perfume on, you might walk away smelling like her perfume. The bees do the same thing around their queen. The queen's scent is actually what bonds the hive together, and that's what they're attracted to. So they don't need to follow her around all the time, but they like to get near her for a little while and then get away and go do what they need to do. Uh, Jackson says, do you ever get stung? Yes, of course, Jackson, I get stung quite often. And Alice said, and Mackenzie both asked, does it hurt? Actually, no, wait, I believe Alice asked, do I ever get stung as well? Mackenzie says, does it hurt? Um, yes and no, it hurts briefly. I can tell you right now that where I got stung setting up was right here on my armpit. It does still hurt a little bit. Uh, it kind of feels like if you got like poked by a splinter and then a few minutes later that spot's still kind of tender. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a throbbing, searing pain. When you very first get stung, now this is for me, different people have different responses. To me, I would like to compare it to a hot needle poking you. Now hopefully you guys have never been poked by a hot needle. Um, but there is a little prick, you've probably been to the doctor and gotten a shot and you used that little needle prick but then it has a burning sensation to it as well. And that is, of course, because when the bee stings you, she injects venom into you. So it is actually damaging the tissue in your body, but it's such a small amount uh, that it's not like it's gonna, you know, hurt you or necessarily kill you. Uh, there is the instance, of course, that people who are deathly allergic to bees. I am not, I've actually built a tolerance, which I know someone else asked about. Um, I'll have to find that question, but uh, there are some people who simply cannot be stung by bees. Their bodies don't know how to respond to it. Me, my body develops a natural response to it, as do most people. Something like 95% of people are naturally resistant to bee stings, but your bodies, if you're not used to getting stung, you'll get stung, it'll hurt, it might swell a little bit, and then it takes a little bit of time for your body to realize what that is and then create antibodies to fight it off and actually get that venom out of your system. Same as how you would fight off the cold, a cold or the flu or anything else. Your body has to develop antibodies to fight it. Because I get stung on a regular basis, my body maintains higher levels of those antibodies. So when I get stung, I react to it very quickly 
and my body fights it off much faster than most people. Most normal people that don't get stung on a regular basis, you get stung, it's gonna swell a little bit, it's gonna be red and itchy. Uh, you know, it would be swell and, and be red the first day. The next day it might itch. That's a natural reaction to you wanting to sort of scratch that venom out from under your skin. But you're already in the healing process. So normally within 30, you know, 24 to 48 hours, it's totally gone and you have no idea that it ever happened. What's interesting for me is when I get stung, it, I react differently depending on where I get stung on my body. If I get stung on my fingertips and my hands, it doesn't bother me one bit. No swelling, uh, no issues, but what I'll have is these little tiny dots on the tip of my finger. A couple weeks later, it'll look like I touched the tip of my finger with an ink pen, but it doesn't hurt me any. If I get stung on my forearms, where there's a lot of soft tissue, I'll get a big red swollen spot and it'll be tender for several days after that. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's just a matter of the different muscle type or the fat content in your body on different spots. I've been stung on the tip of my nose and had nothing happen. I've been stung on the tip of my nose and had my nose swell up between my eyes. So it's kind of random. Well, that's interesting. Back on the question of predator or prey, I don't know if you guys saw that or not, but a dragonfly just flew by and the dragonfly was chasing the bees. I didn't know that dragonflies would prey on bees. I know they prey on mosquitoes. Um, so yes, it, you know, I get stung plenty and it does hurt a little bit, but I'm used to it so it doesn't bother me. Uh, Wyatt asks actually about flowers. How and why do flowers make nectar? Well, Wyatt, this goes way back in evolutionary periods. And this is because flowers, most flowers need to be pollinated for them to make seeds. And what flowers learned back in the day was if they offered a sweet treat, then bees and moths and other pollinators would come to get that sweet treat and by default would crawl around in that flower and transfer the pollen from one flower to the next. So it is a symbiotic relationship. The flowers need the bees and the bees need the flowers and they work very well together. There are flowers out there that don't need bees. A lot of, uh, because they don't need that cross pollination, that flower might be um, self fertile to where it has a stamen and, oh, science teachers help me, I can't remember the other word, pistol maybe. So all it needs to do is be shaken by a bee. So take, for example, a tomato is a good one. A tomato or a pepper, their flowers are self-fertile. They don't need a bee to, poll to carry pollen from one flower to the next, but what they need is to be shaken roughly. Honeybees are very, very delicate and don't do a good job at that, but bumblebees are big and clumsy and bumblebees will shake that flower. So bumblebees are actually better for pollinating things like tomatoes and peppers, whereas honeybees would be better on things that are very delicate flowers that need to have that cross-pollination from one flower to the next. Of course, then you have a lot of plants that are wind pollinated that don't need insects at all. A lot of agricultural crops, crops, uh, corn and beans, and a lot of your big trees, your hardwood trees, your oaks and such, they're all wind pollinated. Down here in the Gulf Coast, we have a lot of pine trees. And in the spring, we get this just yellow pollen everywhere off the pine trees. It looks like it's snowed, but it's yellow instead. It's nasty, it gets on the cars and everything. But that's because those trees don't need bees to pollinate them, they just dump a whole bunch of pollen out and let the wind carry it around where it needs to go. Clara says, what if the other bees took nectar from a flower? So what happens when one bee goes and gets the nectar and another bee goes? Well, there's nothing there, Clara, it's very simple. Um, there's nothing there for them. Now, what's interesting is bees, of course, have a very, very good sense of smell. So they can smell that that flower doesn't have any nectar in it, so they probably won't go to it in the first place. And they can smell that another bee has been there so they're not really attracted. I've seen bees fly up, look at a flower, and then fly away. The third interesting thing is that honeybees can actually see multiple color spectrums. We as people only see the visible light spectrum. Honeybees can see the same colors that we do, and they see the ultraviolet spectrum. Some flowers, once they've been pollinated, will actually change color in the ultraviolet spectrum. So to us as people, that flower has been pollinated, and it just looks the same to us, but the bees can actually see so just imagine in your mind that we see a whole tree as being, I don't know, pink flowers. And the bees fly up and they see a bunch of white and blue flowers. I don't, that's an example. I don't know what color they actually are. But the bees know which color represents that there's nectar and which ones are already cleaned out. So they won't waste any time going to the ones that don't contain anything for them. Uh, Avery says, how long do queens live? We covered that, Avery, three to five years. Uh, Flory says, how is a queen born? So this is very interesting. I mentioned earlier with the queen that the queen can lay fertilized eggs or she can lay an unfertilized egg if she wants to. The queen is only going to lay an unfertilized egg in the event that she wants to raise drones because the hive needs them in the springtime. 
Uh, otherwise, she's going to lay all fertilized eggs, which will all be female bees, which will be your workers. Or if the hive needs a queen at that time, they'll give that baby female larva special treatment and they will actually turn it into a queen bee instead. So a queen bee comes from the same fertilized female egg that could have been a worker. It just depends on how the hive feeds it when it's a little bitty baby. Think about um, royal times, medieval times, when you had kings and you had the royal families and then you had just regular old people. Okay, the royal family ate very, very well. So royalty, because they ate well, raised up to be royalty as well, whereas all the general people, they didn't eat that good. There wasn't that much food, and so they just kind of stayed poor, sad people. It's a very poor example probably, but it's how I like to compare it. So again, a queen comes from the same female fertilized egg that could have otherwise been a worker. It just depends on if the hive raises that one female larva differently and gives it a whole bunch of extra food and the special attention that will make it grow bigger, faster, stronger, and develop the unique pheromones to make it a queen. And again, they'll only do that when they believe that they need to do it. Uh, let me give my smoker a little puff here so it doesn't burn out on us. I know there's questions about the smoker, so we'll get to them, but here I've got my smoker going. Okay, so Delia says, do bees get tired? Yes, they do. They rest at night. The bees are very, very busy. We've all heard the term, you're busy as a bee, right? But the bees do get tired. Now, they don't really ever sleep, but at night they'll all go in the box and they'll just kind of rest. But if you go up in the middle of the night and you knock on that box, you will disturb them and they will come out and they will not be happy. So we don't mess with honeybees at night unless we absolutely have to. The best time to actually work with your beehives is right now in the middle of the day when the weather's good because a lot of the bees are gone and they're out foraging for food, so there's actually not nearly as many bees in the box as there would be normally. If at nighttime you open the box, they're all there and they're all gonna fight. Natalie says, how many bees do you have? Natalie, I don't know. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I really don't know. How many bee hives do I have? I have about mm, 15 to 20. I haven't counted lately and I don't know that they're all healthy and alive because I haven't looked at them lately. Um, but your average healthy beehive, Natalie, is going to have 30 to 40,000 bees in it. Um, I've done removal jobs where I've found hives that had 50 to 60,000 bees. Now, we can't count them. There's just too many of them. It would never work. So what we do is we estimate based on weight. A pound of honeybees is three to 5,000 bees. So just to give you an idea, a small box about half the size of a shoebox, about this big, uh, is what we normally would ship when we send bees around. And on that note, by the way, you can send bees in the U.S. mail. They actually ship them from state to state and even overseas in just this little screen box. That box will contain 12 to 15,000 bees usually in that very small box. And that's considered enough to start a hive. Again, remember I mentioned earlier that just 1,000 bees or maybe even 2,000 bees is not enough. You have to have a lot of bees to really start a hive and maintain a hive. So I don't know how many I have, but I do it on hive count. I have 15 or 20 hives, and they're all different sizes, so I really don't know how many bees I have. Uh, Abby says, why do you separate queens? Well, Abby, that's because there can only be one queen in the hive. That's a matter of dominance between the queens. Only one can be, uh, and again, she's not in charge, um, and there are rare instances where a hive will have a two-queen scenario, but it is not sustainable. In the springtime when the hives are raising new queens and they're swarming and a lot of activities going on, a lot of things are changing very quickly, you can have a short-term two queen scenario, but ultimately you're only gonna have one queen. It's just a matter of, it's a matter of converging the hive, okay? The, remember, the bees are drawn to the smell of that queen. So if you have two queens, two different smells, it's gonna make the hive confused. So you can only have one in order to keep things simple and organized. Raylan says, how can you identify the queen? Raylan, we'll get back to you on that one when we get inside the hive and actually look at it. Uh, Carson says, how do you identify the drone versus the worker? Same thing, Carson, we'll look at that in just a minute, so hit, sit tight. Uh, Zila and David says, why do bees like bright colors? I don't really know that they do, uh, but they, they understand colorful flowers to be a source of food, so they're gonna you know, just a plain old white flower maybe isn't as attractive to them as a, as a pink or a red. Um, but again, remember, they can smell that flower too. So I don't know that they're really attracted to the color as much as they are just the smell. I've had people try to tell me before that they absolutely love purple flowers. I don't know that they do. But ironically enough, I have a purple flower. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. But there's not bees crawling all over these purple flowers. Maybe they've already gotten to them. I don't know. 
Um, Gage and Nathan asked, how many bees are in a hive? I think we already answered that one. We're going to say 30,000 to 40,000 just for fun. That's a healthy, strong hive. Okay, so we're back. Sorry about that. You'll notice moved the camera because I just use my phone for everything. And when you sit out here in the sun, the phone actually gets hot and shuts itself off. Oh, oh, and I lost my pencil. But don't worry, I'm prepared for class and I have a backup. <laughs> okay. Well, that's really going to bother me. I don't know where it went now. Oh, well. Okay, so I think we were talking about, uh, oh, so Gage had just asked the question, do queens and drones have a stinger, which we covered already. Queens have a slick stinger like a wasp. They can sting repetitively, and that's only for the purpose of establishing dominance when they're a new queen in the hive. The drones do not have a stinger, so get you a hold of a drone and have fun. Uh, Gage also asked, can honeybees survive if a spoonful of water is dropped on them? Gage? I don't know why you would ask that, but I don't mind. Uh, anyway, my camera's doing funny stuff. Um, but I don't really mind. Honeybees can get wet. They can drown though. So I don't know that a spoonful of water would really hurt them. But what's interesting about honeybees is they actually breathe through tiny holes in their abdomen. So if you ever see a honeybee sitting on a leaf and you see her abdomen heaving up and down, it's because she's resting on that leaf and she's breathing heavily. So if you were to cover her in something that would coat her abdomen, she can actually suffocate. Um, honeybees that get covered in honey can actually suffocate and or, you know, some people would say drown. I'm going to say suffocate because it's, they can't breathe even if they're not underwater. Um, but I've had bees get covered in honey when I'm doing a removal and I make a mess. And those bees can unfortunately die because they just can't breathe. They're totally covered in honey. Um, but I don't think a spoonful of water would hurt them. I wouldn't encourage it, but I don't think it'll hurt them. Uh, Chase asks, how much honey do honeybees make? Chase, this is very dependent upon the weather. It's dependent upon the size of the hive, and it's dependent, of course, on how much they have to forage on. So if we have a very rainy, wet spring, even if there's lots of flowers, the bees might not necessarily be able to get out in the bad weather to go uh, collect the nectar from those flowers, so they may not make that much. Um, in contrast, if we have a very hot, dry spring or summer, where there's no flowers because it's a drought, same thing, there's not gonna be that much. Um, further, excuse me just a second, further would be if a hive is too small, they can't actually produce a surplus of honey. So two hives that are half the size of one big hive will actually make less honey combined than the one big hive would by itself. And that's because that one big hive has a, a sort of baseline, a, a fixed carrying cost, if you will. Bees that are associated with managing the hive and all the rest of the bees can go to forage and, and get nectar and pollen uh, for the hive. So a bunch of small hives, you know, I could say that I have 30 small hives and might not make any honey. I might say that I have five very large strong hives and get 500 pounds of honey. Um, but on average, what I get with my very passive model of beekeeping, I get about 50 to 60 pounds of honey per year per strong hive. Now again, for example, this one here, it's only a double deep. This is really not a strong hive. Uh, I would wanna see, um, you know, maybe three to four more boxes on top of that and a big strong population of bees to call it a strong hive. Most of my hives that I have right now are small hives because I'm rebuilding after losing almost all of my bees um, in the year 2017. So, uh, that's it for those questions. Now, don't even forget Raylan and Carson. You guys have got questions yet. So those were actually all from the questions that Miss Turner sent me um, from the different groups for, I think it's for the YMCA. So hopefully you guys appreciate getting your questions answered. Now, I wanted to, like I said, um, match this up with another video from the questions that I got from Miss Nichols' class. Um, so these are the questions from her class. Uh, JP says, has there ever been a hive that you couldn't remove? By the way, Miss Nichols' class has been watching a lot of my videos on YouTube, it sounds like, about removal. So they're very intrigued by the removals. A lot of these questions are geared towards that. Has there ever been a hive that you couldn't remove? Um, yes and no, JP. There, there are hives that are in locations that I can't get to. Uh, take, for example, inside of a solid concrete wall. The wall has a hollow inside, but it's concrete. I can't get to it without destroying the wall. 
Now there is a method I use called a trap out to where I'll actually put a one-way door over the entrance of the hive and the bees will come out to go look for food but they can't get back in and then I'll set another beehive right outside the entrance for them to move into. So I'll basically trap them out of where it is that I can't get into and give them another acceptable home right outside that location. So they'll continue to move out and move out and move out. And as the population inside the wall gets lower and lower, eventually the queen will crawl out as well because she'll realize that her hive is dwindling and they'll just all take up in the box. I have done this successfully a few times, but most of the jobs that I do are where I actually open up a structure uh, to get them out. But nothing is impossible. It just takes different tactics and measures. Um, Carson asks, how does the smoke affect the bees and why does it make them sleep? And Caitlin asked, what's in the smoker? So <clears throat> I showed you guys my smoker earlier. It's sitting right here beside the camera where it's out of the way so it's not choking me. What do I put in the smoker? Pine shavings, just regular old wood pine shavings, pine sawdust, you can buy different pellets. But what you want is something that makes a very thick, cool smoke. The more smoke you have and the cooler the smoke, the better. If your smoke is too hot, you can actually burn the bees. Um, why does it make them sleep? Well, it doesn't actually make them sleep, but what it does is uh, the smoke calms the bees down and it does this in two ways. The first is it makes them, when they smell that smoke, they associate that with the threat of fire. So bees might run around and they'll go and start loading up on honey, thinking that they're gonna have to move and go somewhere else in the event of their hive is, you know, it's a grass fire or a forest fire or something and they're gonna have to go somewhere else. So this makes them distracted, it makes them fat and sluggish. After I smoke the bees, oftentimes I'll pull out a frame and I'll see a bunch of little bee butts sticking out at me because they're all in there getting that nectar. The other thing that it does is it masks their ability to communicate with pheromones. You see, inside the beehive, it's completely dark. They cannot see a thing. Only light they have coming in is a little bit through a slot in the front entrance. So inside the hive, they communicate through touch, vibration, and smell, which is the pheromones. Now there's two key pheromones. One smells like lemons, it smells, uh, it, it really it smells just like lemons, it smells amazing. And th that's the bee's happy pheromone. When they're really excited, they want everybody to come over to a certain area, they put off that lemony pheromone. When they're angry and when they sting, they leave behind a pheromone that smells like bananas, and that's the alarm pheromone. So you really don't want to smell bananas. Don't eat a banana and then go play with honeybees, it's not going to end well. Um, when we blow the smoke in the hive, what that does is it masks their ability to communicate with the pheromones. And so if a bee is getting excited and she's putting off that alarm pheromone, ideally the smoke will cover that up. Now too much smoke can be a problem because again, you don't want to totally cover the pheromones, you just want to deaden them down a little bit. So too much smoke can actually cause chaos because then the bees can't communicate at all. So we do just a little light puff of smoke uh, and then you know, kind of give them smoke as needed throughout the process. Now one thing I did want to touch on, it does, general smoke does not put them to sleep. However, in regions of the world where they are highly affected by the Africanized honeybee, which is very, very aggressive, um, general old smoke doesn't work on those bees. And so what the beekeepers will actually do is they'll block the entrance of the hive and they will inject carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide will actually knock the bees unconscious. So you open a box and they all look like they're dead. But they do that just so they can actually get in the box and work because if they didn't, there's no way they can work those bees. They're just too aggressive. So they will actually put them to sleep with carbon dioxide. And then after they leave the hive, after you know some more oxygen gets back in the hive and the bees will start to wake back up. I've never had to do that. I hope I never had bees that mean. But you can actually put them to sleep with carbon dioxide. Uh, Graham says, have you ever had a hive die? Um, kind of same thing, yes and no. They don't really just die overnight. What I have had happen though, Graham, is I've had them starve to death in the winter time. Um, they kind of freeze to death, but what really happens, for me, I don't get that cold down here in the Gulf Coast in Texas, but further north, of course, even up in Missouri, they can freeze to death. But honeybees manage, they, they stay warm inside the hive, even when it's cold and there's snow on the ground outside, inside the center of that beehive, it should be about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But what can happen is if the bees run out of food, effectively they starve to death, and then they don't have the energy to create the warmth they need to stay warm, and so they will starve and then basically immediately freeze to death after that. So I have had them starve slash freeze only one time, and I'll be totally honest with you, it was uh, a very, very aggressive hive that I had removed for a lady. The hive had a history of, uh, it had killed several dogs and almost killed a person. So I brought them out to the farm with basically no food and said, good luck. So that was my nice way of exterminating them without actually exterminating them. 
that's the only one that I know of that ever starved to death under my care. Now, a lot of times what can happen is a hive can have a weak queen and they can, they can be struggling and failing and their population will just slowly dwindle and kind of wither away. And as that happens, if there's a stronger hive next door, that weak hive will tend to join up with the stronger hive. So you don't really just see them outright die. Um, you'll just see that hive kind of wither away slowly. Um, of course, hives can be killed by toxins. Uh, if someone sprays pesticide or if they go and the bees might go and actually get nectar as a food source that's been sprayed with pesticide against their knowledge and they can bring it back to the hive and feed it to all the other bees. And that can actually wipe out a whole hive due to a sort of indirect um, pesticide exposure. Uh, so I don't know that I've ever had that happen. Um, what gets me the most down here, Graham, is actually we have a very small black beetle, and I'll try to show it here in a minute if I can find one, called a small hive beetle. And those small hive beetles are in every single one of my hives. They're everywhere in the Gulf Coast of the United States. They are a subtropical pest. And what they do is they get in the hive and they lay eggs, and when those eggs hatch into larvae, those larvae look like little white worms, and they burrow through the hive. And they eat the honey, they eat the wax, they eat the pollen, they'll even eat baby bees. And as they do, they make such a filthy, rotten mess of the hives that the bees will just leave. They, they can't stand it. Bees are very, very tidy, very clean insects. They like things clean. When they get a nasty mess inside the hive that they can't clean up, they'll just leave and go somewhere else. So I have that happen to me a lot, a lot more than I would like it to happen. Unfortunately, it's just something that I deal with. Um, and again, because I don't use any sort of chemicals or anything in the hive to get rid of those beetles, I just have to deal with it. Uh, Avers, Ivers, I'm sorry. I know I asked how to say your name and now I can't remember. So I'm going to say Ivers. Ivers said, uh, why cage the queen on a removal? Well, that is because, again, as we mentioned earlier in the video, the bees are attracted to their queen. They want to be around their queen. So oftentimes if I catch the queen on a removal, I'll put her in the new box that I want all the bees to go into. And as soon as they smell her, they'll all run over there to that. Um, Oftentimes on removals, I don't find her and that that can be very problematic because if she crawls and goes somewhere down inside the wall or gets to where I can't see her, the bees might all follow her and get to where I can't get to them. So it's very important when I'm doing removals, I try to clean the bees up very quickly and get them, uh, I use a vacuum as you guys have seen in the videos, I try to suck them up and get them caged up and try to get them under control before they have a chance to run away. And I'm always looking for that queen because again, one, doing the removal, that will bring the bees to the box, but two, of course, I want to... <laughs> I want to make sure I get her with the hive when I take them home. I have vacuumed the queen before uh, on purpose and on accident. It's okay, but I really don't like to do it just because I don't want to take the risk of hurting her. I'd rather catch her and be able to look at her in the cage. Uh, Donzel says, do bees build hives in the ground? Honeybees? No. Uh, not ideally. I have gotten them out of water meters and sewer covers that are down below ground level, um, but that's not normal. That's not what they like to do. Now, bumblebees are very much ground dwellers. Bumblebees like to be down low to the ground, um, whereas honeybees prefer to be up high above the ground. Honeybees actually, as far as they're concerned, the higher the better. A lot of times in cities, people actually keep beehives up on the roofs of skyscrapers, 20, 30, 40 stories in the air. The bees will be all the way up there, and they're totally fine with that because, again, they're gonna fly out and they're gonna go wherever they wanna go to go get food. They don't care if they're on top of the building or if they're a foot off the ground, but they don't like to be down at ground level. It's very uncommon to find honeybees at ground level. Braden says, how much money do you make on a removal? Braden, you little mogul, I'm so proud you asked that question. Uh, I price the removals based on the difficulty of how hard I think it's gonna be to get the bees out of whatever structure that they're in. Um, I'm just gonna give you a ballpark here. Most of my jobs I do, 500 to $600 or more. Um, and that kind of comes with the experience. I will tell you when I first started doing them, I was doing it for fun and I wanted to learn and I was doing them for free or very, very cheap. Uh, but I do have some that are expensive. I do have some that are cheap. It just kind of all depends on how hard it is to get to the bees. Um, and similar to that, Emma said, why did you pick this career? Well, Emma, it's really not my career. It is a hobby as far as playing with the bees on the side. And you know, to be totally honest with you, why did I pick it? Because I thought it would be fun. It, I, I never raised up around bees. I never grew up keeping bees. Uh, and when I got out of college and I moved, I got to reading about bees and I just thought, hey, this sounds like fun. So I started researching bees and I absolutely love bees now. I'm totally in love with them. I think it's one of the funnest things I can do. Um, and yes, kind of with Braden's question, I do do it enough that I make a little money. Uh, I'm 
you know, happy that I can do this video for you kids, but I also have kids of my own. So unfortunately I will not go and do this for free because I'd rather stay at home and play with my own kids. So you can make money doing it. It's all about just being smart. Me doing the removals is, uh, it's a bit of a niche market. There's not a lot of people that are beekeepers that like to do removals. They just don't, they don't like the work of it or they don't want to deal with people. I for one really enjoy doing it. So it's good that I found a way to make money doing it as well. Vivian says, how do you mark a queen? Well, Vivian, I don't have my queen marking pin, but what I'm gonna to try to do is I'm gonna to try to catch the queen here in just a minute when we go through this hive and I'll show you how I hold her uh, and put a little dot of paint on her back. So we'll get back to that one. Chance says, what is the biggest removal you've ever done? Chance, we'd have to go back a couple of years on my videos. Uh, I wanna say it was sometime in June, although I can't remember the year. I removed a hive that I estimated the weight of the bees was nine pounds. Um, so that would have been about 40 to 50,000 bees. That's the biggest removal that I've ever done. And what was really interesting on that one is those bees had only been in that house for approximately a week. And I know that because the homeowner told me when she saw them show up and I could tell based on the colors of the comb. Beeswax, when the bees make new comb, it's pure white, it's very clean and it's translucent. Light will pass through it. The older it gets, the darker it gets and the harder that it gets. So this comb and this hive, when I did the removal, was very, very soft. It was collapsing under its own weight. So I knew it was new, fresh comb. Um, so it was a very, very large hive. I would venture to say that it was not a natural swarm, um, but more likely it was an abscond. An abscond means the entire hive leaves. A swarm, only half the hive leaves and goes and looks for a new home. An abscond means the whole hive leaves and goes looking for somewhere else. Maybe they were run off by the beetles that I mentioned. They made a nasty mess of the hive, or it could have been that that hive was in an old house that got torn down or in a tree that got cut down. It's hard to say, um, but 50,000 bees would be very, very large for a normal swarm. I think it was probably a full-on abscond from another location. Uh, Aubrey says, how do you build an immunity to stings? Aubrey, I think we talked about that already. Um, but again, for me, it's, it's really not a true immunity because it does still hurt me and it does still affect me. Uh, but it's a resistance, it's a tolerance that builds up. And then I had one question here that I think Mackenzie asked, but I didn't write it down. Mackenzie, I think, oh, I think your question was, does it hurt? And I think I moved that over to earlier, yes. And yes, it does hurt a little bit. But I'm going to show you guys today, now again, I'm expecting it, so I'm ready for it, but I'm going to show you what happens when a bee stings you. I'm actually going to catch one and sting myself on purpose. So that's it further questions. So we've got a couple to touch back up on. We've got how do you identify the queen? How do you identify the drone versus a worker? And how do you mark a queen? So now what we're going to do is we're going to open up this hive right here. Let's see if I can't just turn my camera. You guys bear with me. This green hive, and I was set up for it so well before, but again, my phone got hot. So now I got these blackberries in the way. Um, but let me just show you a little bit about the hive first. This jar on top is actually how we feed the bees, okay? So we put a little bit of sugar water in here, and it's got these little pinholes in the top. So right now the jar is empty, but I'll fill it up with sugar water, then flip it upside down, and it'll drip just real, real slow, and the bees can get that sugar water. It's just a replacement nectar. So right now in the spring, there's lots and lots of flowers, but later in the summer and in the wintertime, of course, there's no nectar for the bees, and I'm trying to help my bees build up quickly because they're all kind of small and struggling, so I've been feeding them. So it just sits in a hole on top of the lid. Um, a general rule, we're actually behind the beehive right now, so earlier I had you guys set up in front of the beehive and then my camera got too hot. So we're behind the hive now. This is the best place to stand to work with your bees. So let's go ahead and open one up, and we'll go through the process here. We've got our smoker going. Okay, and it's not a very thick smoke, not as much as I would like. Let me see if I still got it burning in here. Oh, it's just about burned itself out, but I think we'll have enough to do the job. So we're gonna pull the feed jar off. We're gonna give them a little bit of smoke right there in that hole in the lid. And you gotta have a hive tool. It's very important that you have this proper hive tool, not a screwdriver, not a butter knife. Now I used to be a little redneck and try to use a butter knife for everything. You need a proper hive tool. I'm gonna try to step these blackberries down out of the way hopefully not cut my foot off in the process because they're thorny okay so we're gonna pry up this back corner of the lid and you do have to pry it because the bees will actually glue the lid down with what's called propolis it's a natural glue that the bees make to seal the hive up we're gonna give them a little bit of smoke under the lid 
Give it a couple seconds for the bees to run down. You don't ever want to just rip the lid off quickly. It can spook the bees and make them get agitated. We take it off and the first thing we do is we look at the bottom of our lid. And we just look real quick to see if the queen's on there. No, she's not. Those little bees right there, those are all female worker bees, okay? Notice their colors, right? We're not yellow, we're not black. They've got some black, but they've actually mostly got tan colors on them, tans and grays. So we'll set, oh, looky here. Uh -huh. Just kidding, I had one of those little green lizards. He came busting out when I laid that lid down. So we're gonna give him a little bit more smoke. And let's pull the frame out here and see what we see. Now this hive is very small. I'm opening this one on purpose just cause I'll be able to work through it quickly. So there's nothing actually on this frame. Okay, this is a plastic foundation that we put in the hive for the bees to use as a guide. Now they don't need that. They don't need us to show them how to build honeycomb, but we put it in there just as a helpful guide. It helps them draw straight. Otherwise they might make crooked combs sometimes. And that just makes things kind of a pain for us. Um, because we need to be able to get in here and work them quickly and effectively. We can't be working with a bunch of crooked combs. Now I just knocked that over. I'm such a bad beekeeper. Okay, so let's pull out another one. Now this one here is covered with bees, so this is going to be a good one. Okay, so we pull this frame out. And the biggest thing that I'm looking for when I'm inspecting my beehives is very quickly I want to look for signs of brood and food, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take this frame just real quick, okay? I'm going to look at this side of it, and I want to hold it out away from me because what I like to look for is the queen. Now, I don't need to see her, but I like to see her. It makes me happy. So I'm going to hold it out away from me so that I can see the whole frame without having to move my eyes side to side. And then I'm going to spin it around and look at the back side, okay? So this way we can check both sides really quickly. Now, I don't see the queen on this one. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock these bees off of here and so I can, so I can show you guys a little closer detail of what we're actually looking at on this hive or on this frame. So we're going to give them a little bit of smoke just to help keep them happy. And then we're going to just give it a shake. Now you hear them buzzing and you see them flying. They're not stinging me. Okay. That did not anger them. It just dislodged them and it gets them a little confused. So they're all buzzing around flying. So what we're looking at here on the combs is all of these cells that are brown cap cells, you can count each individual cap. Every single one of those is a new baby bee. Now you guys probably aren't going to be able to see it in the video because you can't see that close. But what I'm going to look for is down inside of these cells, I'm looking for what looks like a teeny tiny grain of rice in the bottom of that cell. And that is actually the egg that the queen laid. I like to see eggs in the hive. It tells me that my queen is doing her job. If I see the queen, that doesn't really tell me anything other than I have a queen. That queen might not be laying eggs, so I always look for eggs versus the queen. All this cat brood is going to be new baby bees. Up here at the top, we see this band of kind of dusky yellow looking stuff. That's all pollen. That's pollen that the bees have brought in, and the pollen is the bees' protein source. They need that to feed the baby bees. Uh, and then right here in this corner, we've got a little bit of glossy, kind of shiny looking liquid. That's the nectar that the bees are going to turn into honey eventually, or they're going to eat it up for themselves. I've got three or four bees crawling up my leg here, but they're not stinging me. Okay, so let's put this one back and let's grab the next one. So by the way, all of those bees that you were looking at there, those are all workers. None of those were drones and none was the queen. So again, we like to see lots and lots of workers. We really don't care about seeing drones. I like to see the queen because it's just nice, makes me happy. But again, you don't have to see her. So this comb here, by the way, that last one was all, um, that was all natural. This one is all natural as well. So that very first one I showed you, remember it had the plastic backing in it. This one does not have that. The bees have built this comb 100% natural comb on their own. So again, what we're looking at here is a whole bunch of capped worker brood. Uh, we've got a little bit of pollen up top. They normally put the pollen across the top and a little bit of honey. Right here in these cells, you guys may or may not be able to see that looks like some little white grubs. So those are baby larva bees that have not yet been capped off. Um, so again, we're going to look at this one. We're going to spin it around, check the back side. Don't see the queen on that one, but a very good healthy brood pattern. This is a small hive, but they're working very hard to build up. So we'll set that one back in. And again, we'll give them just a little bit of smoke. A lot of times you can only have to smoke them right at the beginning. You don't have to smoke them the whole time, but I always like to give them a little bit more. 
Now you guys might be wondering, can kids work with beehives? Absolutely. My oldest daughter is six years old, named Mackenzie, ironically enough, and she loves coming out to the beehive. I have a little bee suit for her to put on just to be safe. Oh, look at here. There's our queen. Okay, now I cheated. I've put a, a white dot of paint on her back, um, as, one of you, as some of you guys have asked about. But the way I would do that, I'm actually gonna catch a drone. You see this big fat one right here? That's a drone, okay? I'm gonna catch him just for fun because I don't want to catch my queen and possibly hurt her. So I've got that drone, and right now I'm just holding him by his shoulders. So I'm not hurting him at all. I've got him pinned, but I'm not hurting him. And I'm gonna show you guys. So this is how I would hold the queen, okay? I would catch her by her back, and I've got another video you have to find where I actually show this with a queen. I'll catch her by her back, and then I flip her over, and I put her right on the tip of my finger, and I'll get her to grip onto my finger, and then I'll take a little paint pen and just put a dot right there on her thorax. So again, the queen we were just looking at, she had that white dot. Now since we're holding this drone, I'll show you again. He can't sting me, he has no stinger. But what you can tell with the drones, how you identify the drones, is they have great big eyeballs. So if my camera will focus in there on him, maybe. He's got really big eyeballs. Let's see if we can make this focus. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe not. Anyway, you guys get the point. You see his big eyeballs. His whole head look, looks like he's wearing great big sunglasses, okay? Now, the drone also has a stockier body. So when you look at him from on top, you see that big, fat abdomen. The drones are big, fat, clumsy things. We'll turn him loose. You can see he flew away just fine. Let's pull that frame back out and try to find our queen again. And I'll show you. Now, again, everything you're looking at here is almost all primarily worker bees, okay? And that's fine, that's what we want to see. We want to see more worker bees than anything else. Now I've lost that queen. Oftentimes I'll set, I'll set her in and she'll, she'll crawl around and she'll try to hide. So let's see if she didn't jump over onto the next frame maybe. Again, the queens are very skittish. They don't like to fight, they just want to run and hide. So when you pull them out and you expose them like this, their first instinct is just to run away. I don't see her on here, but we'll find her back. I promise you she's in there. What I was trying to see, that's kind of interesting. Those two look like they're fighting almost, don't they? That might be a drone from another hive, I'm not sure. Now this frame is actually very full of pollen. See this bee right here? You see she's got the yellow puff balls on her back legs? So that's actually balls of pollen on her legs. So when the bees are flying around and they get pollen off the plants, they'll stop on a leaf and they'll brush all that pollen down onto their back legs. They actually have little pollen baskets. Here's another one. They have what they call pollen baskets on their back legs. So they'll brush that down to make those little granules of pollen. And that's how they carry it to the hive. We've got a few more drones. See, here's a big fat drone here. Big drone there, drone there. So I don't mind seeing a few drones, you know, but I don't really, I don't like to see any more than a few really because you don't need them. In the springtime there's always a lot more because the hive will always raise a bunch of drones in the spring when there's lots of food and they can afford them. I gotta find that queen back to show you guys because I know you want to see her. There we go real quick. So this hive in general though, they look they look okay. They're small um, but they're they're taking care of their business and they're doing just fine. So I'm gonna keep feeding them to help keep encouraging um, that build up. You always want your hives to be big and strong. You don't ever want small, weak hives. They're just not productive. Sometimes the queen will hide down here on the bottom of the frame. You can't see her. Goodness gracious me. I lost the queen. Maybe she's over here on this last frame. No, lost her again. Well, she's in there, you guys saw her, right? <laughs> Let's see if she's down inside the box hiding from me. By the way, I haven't been stung yet, I promise. I'll tell you guys if I do. So again, these are very gentle bees. These are the bees that I like to keep for this exact reason, because they're gentle, they're easy to work with. And in general, the honeybees don't mind. You know, I'm not getting in here, I'm not roughing them up, I'm not being abusive. 
I'm working gently, which is also a reason why I like to not wear a suit because it encourages me, it reminds me to be gentle and careful with them. Sometimes if I put a suit on, it makes me feel like I'm invincible and I'll get to working fast and I'll be smashing bees. I really don't want to do that, it's just not nice. Now they don't have any surplus honey. I was going to show you guys some honey, but they don't have any capped honey. Just looking one more time for our queen. I bet she's hiding over here on the end bar somewhere, and that's why we can't see her. Or she's hiding in on the inside of the box. Sometimes she'll jump off the frame and she'll hide inside the box. Or she'll run out the entrance of the box. And what you can do, what I normally do when I'm really looking for the queen, is I look for where the bees are running. Because again, we mentioned earlier, they will run to the queen. They'll follow the queen. So they're being gentle on this frame, but they're not really running any given direction. We're going to pull that last one one more time. And I'm sorry if I don't find her, but we don't want to keep the box open too long. Because that can actually aggravate the bees too. It makes them feel insecure. Just like you wouldn't leave the front door of your house standing open all the time. So if, they, if we leave it open too much, they can actually get insecure and it might make them actually abscond and leave and go somewhere else. Well, no. Oh, there she is. She's in here hiding on the inside of the box. Crafty queen. Let me see if I can catch her for you. Here we go. There's our queen. So she's crawling. Oh, she's flighty. I don't want her to fly away. She's kind of clumsy. But you guys get a good look at her there. You see she has a much longer abdomen. She has much longer legs. And of course she has that white dot on her thorax, which I gave her that. If it wasn't for that white dot of paint, she would have a shiny black thorax. So that's how you identify. I'm going to go ahead and catch her because she's getting flighty. So I'm going to put her back in the box. So we'll put her right back on the frame and she crawls down inside. We don't like, I don't like to keep my queens out too long and make them nervous. I have had the queens actually fly away before and fly out of the box and go hide somewhere else and then I have to go find her. Because uh, sometimes the queen will fly out and then she'll get lost and she doesn't know how to get back to the box. She'll fly just randomly looking for somewhere that she feels safe and then she'll get lost. So lastly, we're going to slide that last frame back in that we pulled out initially. You don't ever want to leave a gap in the hive. The bees have a very, they're very particular about the shape and the spacing in their hive. So you want to put everything back just like you found it. I'll take my sunglasses off of here. And I'm going to give them a little bit more smoke just to kind of push them down. My smoker's pretty well totally burned out. We'll take our lid, set it right back on top. Now as we do, we'll set it down where we don't see any bees and then we'll slide it over slowly make sure that any bees that are in the way can get out of the way. Now if you smash one or two, that's okay, that happens. Oh, you know what? I didn't show you a sting. <laughs> okay, I promised it. Let me see if I can find one to sting me. So the trick is you gotta catch them and control them without getting stung and doing it. Let's see if I can catch this one right here. Okay, I got her caught and her stinger's gonna come right out of the back end here. So what I'm gonna do is put her, she's trying to sting right now because she's mad. I'm going to put her on the back of my hand and get her to sting me if I can. So what I do is I put her stinger right down on my hand and then try to press on her. Oh, she's got a... Look at this. This is interesting. You see that little bitty bug on her back? Can you guys see that? It's a little bitty red insect on her back. That's called a varroa mite. And that's like a little tick. That little mite actually bites her and drinks her blood and makes her sick. Let's see if we can get her to sting here. Hmm. Nope, she won't do it. Look at that. Oh, there she did sting me. Okay, just barely. So, I don't even feel it. But let me see if I can get the... So here's the stinger in my hand, okay? She basically dropped that reactively. I don't even... I honestly, I don't feel it. And it's not because I'm that tough. It's because she didn't actually sting into my skin. But if you guys look very close, notice that stinger's moving, okay? It's still twitching because when she tears loose, there's a nerve response that makes that stinger sit there and it's pumping. It's trying to inject more venom into me. Now I wanted to show you guys this so that when you, if you ever get stung by a bee, 
do not pinch that stinger and pull it out because you squeeze those sacks. So what you want to do is you want to find something with a relatively sharp edge, uh, you know, a credit card or something or a little, if you carry a pocket knife, and don't cut your hand, but use the sharp edge of whatever that is and get under that stinger and scratch it out, okay? Because what that will do is it'll get that venom sack away from your body and not actually smash it and drive it in deeper. Um, you can use even just your fingernail. You can just take your fingernail and scratch it out like that, but you do not want to pinch it and pull it. So there I did get stung. I don't know, was it fair, was it good enough? Maybe I should do another one. She wouldn't sting me, I was trying to make her. Some of them really are that gentle that they just won't sting. What it is a lot of times is if you catch a forager, the foragers are not defensive at all. And so they're actually very reluctant to sting. See even these, I'm trying to get them. See that lizard? I'm trying to get them, I'm trying to catch one and what they're not, they're not uh, standing up and trying to battle me off. They're actually just running away. This one's got her stinger out, she wants it. Come on, baby. Nah. Ah, that one got it. So that's actually a real sting. Yes, I can feel that one. <laughs> and now I'm actually gonna leave this one in because I'm crazy. But it's because of that tolerance that I was telling you guys about, and I actually haven't been stung other than this morning, setting up. I haven't been stung in a long time. So I'm actually gonna leave that one in on purpose because I want to get that full dose of venom and build up that tolerance. So that's it for that. We put our jar back on. I need to come feed the bees again soon because again, we've been trying to keep them fed on a regular basis. Quite a long video, I know, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. Maybe we'll watch it in bits and pieces. But I hope I got all your questions answered and I encourage you guys to continue to ask questions, continue to learn. Your teachers know how to get a hold of me. They know how to look up my information. They can keep sending me questions and I'll keep sending you answers. I can't promise that I'll make another video, but I will answer your questions. I want you guys to learn. I love talking about bees. I hope you guys love learning about them as much as I do. They're very, very fascinating little creatures. So with that, we're done. Hope you guys like it.